The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon. I'm Professor John Jackson, and it's my pleasure to serve as the coordinator for the Issues in National Security Lecture Series and as your MC for today's event. I extend a wish for a happy new year as we kick off the second half of our lecture series. Rear Admiral Chatfield is unable to join us this week, but she sends her greetings and warm wishes as well. For anyone just joining us, I want to reiterate that this series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport. We will be offering nine additional lectures between now and May of 2021 spaced about two weeks apart. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each year has been posted by our public affairs office. Each event will consist of several parts, the scholarly speaker's presentation followed by a question and answer period. And frequently we will follow the lecture with the family discussion group meeting. We will not be doing so today because we're still finalizing our roster of guest speakers for the remainder of the series. Okay, enough background and admin, let's proceed to the main event. Today's lecture on national security and space will survey how space has factored into U.S. national security from the days of Sputnik to the emerging era of great war competition, great power competition, excuse me. The presentation will describe potential threats and policy responses facing American space power today. We'll discuss future possibilities challenges, and misperceptions around the new U.S. Space Force. Our distinguished guest speaker is Dr. David Burbach. He is an associate professor in the National Security Affairs Department here at the Naval War College. He holds a Ph.D. in political science from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a Bachelor of Arts in Government from Pomona College. He currently teaches U.S. foreign policy, international relations, and space security. His scholarly interest includes civil military relations, defense planning, and the relationship, excuse me, my notes are not right, between international security and technology, particularly with regard to space and nuclear issues. Before joining the Naval War College faculty in 2007, Professor Bach taught at the Army School of Advanced Military Studies and worked for several policy analysis and information technology organizations and in astronomy and space education. As a reminder, during the formal presentation, please submit any questions you may have using the Zoom chat function. Dr. Burbach, I can't resi resist the urge, so let us boldly go where no one has gone before. Over to you, sir. I believe you're muted, Dave. I am absolutely muted. Thank you. Let me try that again. Thank you very much, Professor Jackson, for the introduction. Uh, and thank to all of you for your interest in the subject. I appreciate you taking time uh, out of your afternoon to join us today for this talk on space, space and national security. Um, and what I'd like to do today, as, as the introduction stated, is give you first a bit of historical sense of where we've been in space, where we've come from, uh, you know, a, a galaxy near to home, you know, a few decades in the past, um, and how space has been critical, a critical national security player for decades, talk about some of the things that are changing with respect to space, new challenges, new possible strategic directions, uh, and a little about Space Force and also on the civilian side, our plans to return to the moon and how, what the national security connections are there. Um, but let me begin by noting by, first of all, let me begin by sharing the uh, slideshow that I have going so that you can also join in it. And um, 
as you know, we often think of space as something new. We talk about the space age or, you know, it seems so advanced. Um, yet we're coming up on just about the 100th anniversary of rocketry. On the left hand side of your screen there, you actually see Clark University professor Robert Goddard just up the road in Worcester, Massachusetts, the uh, real developer of some of the first rockets as we would know them today beyond kind of the, the very old fashioned, uh, you know, uh, black powder uh, that was used for centuries. Um, by the time of World War II, the uh, Germans had developed the V-2 missile. And of course, today we have a variety of extremely advanced intercontinental missiles. So we've actually had rockets uh, longer than we've had helicopters, you know, for military use, if you count the V-2. Um, and we make use of a tremendous variety. So one thing I, I, uh, I wanted to show this to start off by saying, I'm not going to say much about rockets in this presentation. I, I know often the most exciting part of space is the how do you get there? Many of you may follow uh, the exploits of SpaceX uh, and the, the reusable rockets they've developed. I'm going to focus on space applications uh, for military and civilian use, more on the satellites and what they do and how that's relevant to us down here on Earth. Um, so I won't be saying much about the, the space shuttle or about the or about SpaceX, but really focusing on what does space do for us and how is that relevant to today's national security policy. Now, even in space use, uh, we've been at it a long time. We're coming up, space uh, satellites are almost old enough to retire. The first uh, Sputnik satellite, we're coming up on the 65th anniversary of Sputnik next year. Um, and so for more than six decades, uh, we've been operating in space. Uh, we and other countries have been launching satellites, launching humans for almost 60 years for military applications, commercial applications, scientific exploration. Um, it's been, you know, space has been tremendously important for, for quite some time. And when, you know, when you think about, well, what, what is the space age all about? You know, what, what, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if one of the first things that comes to mind for you um, is exactly the 1960s space race, the race to the moon, the uh, the Apollo landings, you know, John Glenn, Yuri Gagarin. Um, it, back in the 1950s and 60s, space was seen as the very forefront of political competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, if you see the cartoon that I have in the upper right corner of my slide, uh, it's a photocopy of a newspaper from the 1950s, so it, it may not, I apologize if it's not legible on your screens, but it shows Soviet Premier Khrushchev holding the hand of, of a woman labeled lesser nations. Eh, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd be a little more diplomatic in how we phrase that now. But Khrushchev wooing the lesser nations by pointing to Sputnik. Who else can give you a moon while sad Uncle Sam looks on with a box of chocolate? You know, how can you possibly compete? And that's exactly how space was seen, that there were nations all over the world who had to choose do we, which horse do we want to back? Do you want to back the horse that's going to the moon or the horse that's going nowhere? And so we found we thought it really important to show show the so show the world that we could get there first. And we we and the Soviets both made great propaganda use you know, or political use uh, to, to use a better uh, a nicer term, I guess. Um, you know, you see a Soviet postcard featuring their first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, or after our first astronaut orbited the Earth, uh, Marine John Glenn. Um, we actually sent his capsule around the Earth a fourth time, a fourth orbit. It was called doing a 30-city world tour. You see people lined up there in Mumbai, India to see it. Um, you know, we sent it all over the world to sh so that people everywhere could see what the American space program was up to. Now, the, the crowning achievement of that era was when Americans actually landed on the moon. Um, 650 million people watched in live TV, uh, which at that point was one out of every six people in the world. And remember, TV was pretty new. And in fact, the U.S. recognizing the importance of communicating that, I mean, this was not happenstance. We actually worked with countries to help them improve their TV networks or install TV networks so that everybody could see that American flag planted on the moon. And you see there in Australia, a department store crowded at six in the morning local time, uh, you know, people who didn't, didn't have a television at home who wanted to see it. So this this was a tremendous accomplishment, you know, brought pride, you know, diplomatic accomplishments. Um, but that's only one part 
of the space program. Uh, is in those early days, space, as much as it was for prestige and, and the glory of seeing astronauts land on the moon, there was also a space program that was much quieter. And just as importantly, space was used for spying. And before saying a bit about that, let me just try and, and put you back in, you know, send you back in time because we're used to a world of visibility today. This is uh, what you see in front of you is a satellite image of the Chinese Ministry of Defense complex taken uh, within the last year that I downloaded over this weekend with Microsoft Bing. Any of you, I mean, I, I hope you keep listening. If any of you wanted to pull up satellite images of Chinese Navy bases, you could do it in a, on a moment's notice. It's easy. If you were willing to spend a few thousand dollars, you could have a company take an image tomorrow of a Chinese Navy base and give it to you. That's not what the world was like when the space age was born. We faced a rival that was incredibly secretive um, to the point that literally we we had to rely in some cases on maps that we had captured from the Germans that they had made when they invaded the Soviet Union in World War II, old maps from the Tsarist era. Um, the Soviet Union made it very difficult. You know, they would even obfuscate where cities, whole cities were located. So we faced a nuclear rival and had almost no way of knowing what they were developing, how many nuclear missiles, nuclear bombers they had deployed, and especially no easy way to see telltale signs of were they getting ready for a surprise attack on the United States. Now, what we came up, you know, what we saw as an opportunity to deal with that was what if you go into space? What if you send cameras into space? And so the number one, you know, the Eisenhower administration identified in the late 1950s, even before Sputnik, we had started satellite imaging programs that our number one priority for national security had to be getting uh, sat reconnaissance satellites in orbit that could see what do the Soviets have, where is it located, are they getting ready to launch an attack on us? And so within two years after Sputnik, we had launched satellites that could return film images down to the Earth. And you see there an example from the early 1980s, a photograph of a Soviet ballistic missile submarine. Um, President Johnson, you know, 10, 10 years later, uh, just before the moon landings, uh, you know, President Johnson was quoted. Apparently, he said he didn't want to be quoted, but he he, had, he didn't say off the record. Uh, the New York Times quoted him at uh, one, uh, you know, informal gathering as saying, you know what? The whole space program would be worth it just for those satellite photos, just so that I as president know, I don't guess, I know how many missiles the enemy has. And so in those early days, space was really all about, uh, was all about reconnaissance, spying, early warning. You know, and Johnson here says, if we had to spend 10 times as much as the moon race cost, it would be worth it for that quiet, covert reconnaissance side. Now, we developed other military space applications way back in those early days as well. I've got examples of satellites from a couple of decades here, but we had at least the, the basic systems for all of these military functions going well back. Um, one of the most critical uses of space, in addition to the spy satellites to see you know what the other side was up to, uh, in the upper right there, we developed missile warning satellites that could see the infrared, uh, you know, the, the bright flame plume using infrared telescopes um, so that if the Soviets launched missiles at us, we would have, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of warning. They get here in only about half an hour, um, but we would have that half an hour. We would have the maximum possible warning um, so that we could take we could take action. Uh, in that awful situation. So we developed warning satellites. We developed navigational satellites. I mean, the uh, one of the, the Navy developed a very early system, you know, much more rudimentary and cumbersome than GPS uh, as early as 1964 and the transit satellites. We put up weather satellites, uh, civilian and military. Uh, we put up communication satellites. You can see a modern looking communication satellite there in the lower right. Uh, if you look carefully just below the satellite, there are some, the, the the tech, unfortunately, everyone's in white. It's white, white uh, clad people in a white room. But if you if you can see the size of the people down there, I mean, those antennas are several feet across each. I mean, this is these these satellites these days are really quite substantial pieces of hardware with amazing capabilities. Um, you know, so within you know within ten years of Sputnik, we already were making heavy military use of space. We also had given thought to well, how do you keep the adversary from using space? Um, and we developed some rudimentary anti-satellite systems. The the one the U.S. actually deployed um, 
we didn't have the the sensor and computer technology to hit satellites head on uh, like we do now. So we used a nuclear weapon, you know, and would set up set off nuclear blasts in space. You can see a test of such a weapon viewed from Hawaii there in the early 1960s. Um, you know, we learned that those produce a lot of radiation in space. And if you set off one nuclear weapon, you, you'll get the satellite you're aiming at, but the leftover radiation circling the Earth will destroy lots of satellites. In fact, that nuclear test you see there destroyed the first AT&T test communications TV relay satellite um, that, you know, we, oops, you know, we, we didn't mean to do that, but we learned that uh, you don't, you know, Space is actually pretty easy to mess up. It's it's easy to environmentally damage space. The Soviets in the 1970s tested a non-nuclear weapon where you know a sat satellite would you know the the weapon would gradually match orbits with a target and then explode. But if any of you saw the movie Gravity a few years ago, you already have a sense of what that can do. It creates lots of little pieces of debris that moving, you know, at hyper velocity in orbit, you know, something the size, you know, of a, a nut or a bolt uh, can destroy a satellite. So we, we, we both learned early on it's possible to build anti-satellite weapons, but it's actually pretty difficult to use them without messing up space for for yourself too. So, you know, we um, we learned that anti satellite weapons were difficult. I, I'm not going to say much about weapons from space, but I really some of you may may wonder about that possibility. Back in the Cold War, we actually thought about the possibility of putting nuclear bombs in orbit so you could deorbit them in, on command and have them come back to Earth. And both the U.S. and the Soviets realized. So what what good is that? And we both kind of said, not much, really, other than maybe like, you know, maybe it comes back when you don't want it to. Or, you know, it get, the nuclear bomb gets hit by space debris. You know, it just seemed like a bad idea. Neither side really wanted to do that. We've also talked about the idea of you could have non-nuclear, just a big hunk of steel or tungsten or something come back from space at hypersonic speed and you know you bring one of those down on an enemy tank or an enemy ship and even without a nuclear blast you do a lot of damage um you know, again we decided too expensive too technically difficult uh relative to the advantages so neither side even today really was seriously interested in bringing down weapons from space so kind of the the classic cold war use of space was in some ways, pretty restrained when it came to war fighting. Um, in public, both we and the Soviets were very active in peaceful competition for you know human exploration, for sending probes to Mars, Venus, you know, and other planets, um, using space to show off national capability and prestige. Secretly, both sides relied very heavily on strategic surveillance and early warning from space. Um, and so we realized if we attack the other side satellites, it'll damage our own satellites, and they might get scared that we're about to launch a surprise first strike, and they might launch first. A, a security dilemma. Uh, if uh, you know, so you you may. Th those of you who have been through NSA already probably will have seen that in your security strategies readings. Uh, you know, for those of you who are NWC students, um, you know, both sides pretty afraid. So both both sides actually managed to be relatively restrained, and we kind of left you know treated space something as a sanctuary, uh, a term people like to use. You know, we, we put up these capabilities and didn't plan to do much war fighting in space. And I, I'm simplifying. There there have been, you know, there, you know, you may be asking, what about Reagan's strategic defense initiative? I'd be happy to talk about that in Q&A. But, you know, a few diversions aside, um, we didn't do a lot of space war fighting. Um, now, what's different today it, you know, than those Cold War days is space is now in everything, tactically and, you know, at the civilian level. Um, we make tremendous use of space capabilities for, uh, you know, as you can see, a, 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 a Marine there on a satellite use, doing a, a satellite phone, um, you know, the rather convoluted DOD graphic in the, the lower quadrant shows, uh, you know, how we plan to use lots of satellites for communications and, and battle data networks. Um, but we all make use of satellites all the time. I mean, I've, you know, you, I've got 
my cell phone. I'm sure you all uh, have them too. Using GPS, many people have direct broadcast TV. Um, we use it for, you know, it is it is just basic, you know, all throughout our daily lives um, in ways that you might not even realize. I mean, we all understand we use GPS now so that our car can tell us where to go so that nobody knows how to use a uh, paper roadmap anymore. Um, but more subtly, GPS also provides highly accurate clock signals, extremely precise timing. And it turns out that computer networks and the cell phone network need that to kind of keep track, you know, synchronize all the data streams. The electric power grid also uses GPS timing to keep everything synchronized. Banks use the GPS data for highly accurate timestamps on transactions. So you can figure out, you know, if person A and person B both tried to sell the same stock, you know, who got the order in first. And of course, knowing weather forecasts, uh, you know, phone calls, I, you know, I, maybe there's even data going through a satellite, you know, to somebody involved in, in this Zoom uh, conference. And on the, on the military side too, space is no longer just about supporting strategic nuclear capabilities. But you know, for the last 20 some years, uh, we've gotten used to using space for precision targeting of conventional weapons, for knowing exactly where your ship or your Humvee or, you know, your F-16 is, um, for listening in, you know, not only on Soviet nuclear command networks, but terrorist cell phones, controlling uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. You know, uh, last year when the Iran, just about just about one year ago, when the Iranians launched missiles at the U.S. base in Iraq, um, we detected that with our early warning satellites. And that's how we were able to give uh, the uh, American soldiers there, t warning to get out and get into bunkers uh, in the few minutes they had before those missiles hit. So we really depend on space for all sorts of everyday tactical military operations and in our civilian economy. Well, so what's different now? Um, you know, what's changing is in this era of great competition is, you know, we're, we're going against Possibly. I mean, hopefully we never have to. But should we in order to be prepared for potential conflict with more sophisticated peer adversaries, um, Russia and China are both spacefaring powers of their own. Um, they have the same sorts of capabilities that we do. Russia and China each have their own equivalent of GPS. In fact, your phone probably receives the Russian GLONASS signals. I, I don't think many cell phones here use the newer Chinese Baidu system, but you know there are uh, currently four different navigational systems. You know They have their own reconnaissance satellites, their own military communications networks. So we're going, we would be facing peers that have some of the same force-enhancing capabilities from space that we do. Now, what's especially different, though, is in the post-Cold War era, whether we were fighting uh, Iraq or Serbia or terrorist networks, we were fighting adversaries that had no ability to shoot at or otherwise really disrupt our space capability. Space truly was a sanctuary. Um, so we could use, you know, space advantages with impunity. You know, we could use GPS, we could, you know, use uh, reconnaissance satellites, and the people we were in conflict with couldn't do anything about it. Well, Russia and China can. Um, they have counter space capabilities. They've been investing in capabilities. They may even have an, have an asymmetric advantage in that our militaries, uh, the U.S. and allies, are probably even more dependent uh, upon space technology and integration of all of these space information services than their militaries are. Likewise, our civilian economy is more dependent upon technical information services. Um, we can be, you know, we can be more easily disrupted by the loss of civilian space capabilities than the Russian or Chinese economy. Uh, the other factor is that geography matters. You can see in my, uh, you know, my my very high tech Google Earth graphic there. Uh, if we were in a conflict in the South China Sea, we're operating over many thousands of kilometers. Um, away from Washington or away from Pearl Harbor, where our command centers are across sheer oceanic terrain, without satellites, we can't communicate. Whereas, you know, Beijing can rely on fiber optic lines to reach its, it reach its coastal Navy bases uh, and then has a much shorter distance to where we, we think there may possibly be conflict. So the fact that we're operating over very, very long pure oceanic uh, 
terrain um, means that we really depend on space to be able to keep operating. So, you know, that that provides some real incentives for potential adversaries to think about what can I do uh, about those advantages that the U.S. and its allies would have. Um I won't say too much uh, about specific technologies here other than that the the sort of anti-satellite weapon where you go up and smash the other guy's satellite by crashing into it. Technology has gotten better, and especially there's a real overlap now between ballistic missile defense technology and anti-satellite weapons. Uh, some of you may know about 10 years ago, the U.S. used uh, a uh, an SM uh, I'm going to get my blocks wrong, but SM-3, I think, uh, missile off of an Aegis cruiser uh, that was really intended for ballistic missile defense, but we took out one of our own satellites that was about to re-enter in low Earth orbit. Uh, the Chinese, the Russians, and now also India has a capability like that. Um, now, those sorts of attacks create dangerous debris. We we hope they don't do it, but they the capability is there. It could even be that adversaries are experimenting with a technology that wouldn't cause so much degree, where the uh, the the photo you see on the lower lower right um, is you know that that's actually from a, a, an example of a, a potentially a robot spacecraft meeting to refuel and service a satellite. But if you have an arm that can stick out and refuel a satellite, you could just as easily stick out an arm with a sledgehammer and, you know, bash the other guy's solar panels or, you know, shears and snip wires. Or, I mean, as silly as this may sound, essentially a can of spray paint and spray it over, you know, the uh, the camera opening on a spy satellite. That wouldn't cause debris, but it would make the mission impossible. Both sides have jamming capability. We there may cyber can't really. There's nothing that's really discussed in an unclassified way with cyber against satellites, but we imagine it's possible. But it's definitely possible to jam the command and control links to satellites. Uh, as a reconnaissance satellite, uh, you could, in principle, blind it by shooting a laser at it when it's passing overhead. And we believe the Chinese have actually experimented with that against some U.S. satellites. Uh, the U.S acknowledges that we have communications you know unclassified you know that that you know that that photo there is a public affairs photo that's not off off of cipernet you know we acknowledge that uh we have satellite jamming capabilities uh and presumably the the other side does too um and i'll just very quickly note you may not even have to go to space uh satellites need ground facilities to communicate uh one of the main space force communication stations is actually uh just about uh, 100 miles north of here in New Hampshire, um, or China actually has leased space for a satellite communication station in Sweden. Um, you know, uh, depending on where, like, I, I, I think in a conflict, it's unlikely that China or Russia would be able to attack uh, the new Boston, New Hampshire tracking station, uh, I hope. Uh, but that's certainly a possibility, too. So we, we worry on a number of fronts that capable peer adversaries might be able to uh, might be able to do something uh, that would affect our capabilities, you know, whether it be by physically attacking satellites, by using electronic warfare or cyber warfare to prevent the satellites from functioning. Um, one, one, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'll back up for just a moment on my cyber point. One thing that's especially uh, could be troublesome here, I note the advantage of hard to attribute. Um, if you see an anti-satellite missile coming up at your satellite, you have some idea who did it because you can see where it was launched. If your satellite is uh, all, of, all of a sudden your satellite isn't transmitting anymore, um, is that because a cosmic ray disabled its computer or is that because of an adversary cyber attack? If your electro-optical sensor fails, was it blinded? Or, you know, did it actually, you know, did a piece of debris hit it? You know, it's it can be it can be very difficult to to even be certain were we attacked? Well, you know, in some ways it's it's like cyber or like counterintelligence capabilities where there's probably a lot of sort of cat and mouse, you know, secretive who did what, what was that intentional? Um, was it the adversary we think or was somebody else trying to to provoke something? You know, a lot a lot of opportunity for some some, you know, really difficult to figure out scenarios there. So what do we what do we do about all this? Uh, and there are a couple of different directions that you see people suggesting that we respond. Well, you know that 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 all have some some different advantages and disadvantages. Um, and you know, let me you know to to say a bit about these. Um, one option would be resilience 
to make the uh, the satellites that we have more difficult to attack to build in redundancy uh you know have more satellites um and in fact those those are you know two two competing ideas right now and it's not necessarily obvious which is better because one option would be essentially to make the satellites that we have which are already very expensive to build them even more robustly maybe even add defensive systems you know sort of like you know on a ship the those of you who are in the navy when all sea whiz there's there's a short range defense system that will shoot at incoming planes or cruise missiles maybe we could even put defensive equipment on satellites like that it's you know it's possible the other option is to go in the direction of instead of having 20 or 30 highly capable big expensive satellites recall the photo i showed you of that communication satellite that you know was as as big as a school bus um instead of having a you know a handful of those what if you have a thousand satellites you know that are each that big um and you know that rely on having many satellites networked together with dispersed capability if the adversary has to target a thousand small satellites that's a much harder problem than if they need to target 10 20 four or five uh, very large satellites. And that's, you know, we see the commercial sector moving that way uh, towards large constellations of many satellites that are relatively cheap and relatively expendable. Um, And there's a lot of interest on the military side in doing that. Or maybe we look at alternatives and whether alternative means, you know, we do better at using fiber optic cables instead of space links in some places. It could even, it also means alternatives like knowing how to do celestial navigation in case they take GPS away. Or in our exercises, in our war games, in our doctrine development, thinking hard about what do we do if we lose space capabilities, having people who aren't space experts know what do we lose and how do we think we're going to operate without that capability, being ready and practiced for that eventuality? Um, we might also use deterrence um, and you know make it clear to potential adversaries that space is off limits. Space is special um, for a number of reasons. You know that we're opposed to debris because that'll mess it up, space mess space up for everybody in the world. Um, that we consider space so critical to nuclear warning and nuclear command and control that you know stay away from that. It'll you know if you attack us in space, it's going to make us really worried that there's a nuclear strike coming. So we could tell adversaries if you go after our space targets, we're going to go really hard after your space targets. Or that we'll go after targets on Earth. If you attack us in space, uh, we'll consider that justification to attack, you know, senior command headquarters uh, in your country that we otherwise would leave alone. Um, You know, the detail, you know, putting aside whatever details, we'll basically rely on threats of punishment um, and, you know, hope that that works. And, you know, it might. The, the worry there is that since we do worry that there's this asymmetric advantage to the United States in space, that if essentially we tell China or we tell Russia, we'll do a trade. You know, you go after our satellites, we'll wipe out our of your, all of yours. The worry would be they might be OK with that trade. Uh, they might figure, well, that leaves us that that leaves us worse off, but it leaves the United States relatively much worse off. Um, and so the question then is, what do you do? And for attacking targets on Earth, is destroying a satellite, a piece of property, no lives lost, does that justify killing people on Earth? And we've seen this this concern with respect to unmanned uh, unmanned drones. Uh, last year, the Iranians shot down, or maybe it was 2019, shot down an American drone over the Persian Gulf. And one, we, we ended up not responding. President Trump came close to responding, decided not to. And a factor that loomed large in the people who thought we shouldn't respond was, do we really want to take lives over a piece of property with no human lives lost or even human lives risked in what the Iranians did? Um, and there, you know, the research done by uh, people here at the War College has found that there's a big reluctance to take lives in exchange for taking down an unmanned vehicle or a cyber attack that doesn't have human casualties. Space, too, we probably would wonder, is it worth killing people over a satellite? Um, You know, another idea would be 
going for a very dominant approach. See, seize the high ground. Uh, if, if, and if you if you have wondered when am I going to say ultimate high ground, I, I, I'm not going to say it except when I have a sarcastic look on my face because I I don't think that's probably the right way to think about space. Um, but I might be wrong, and there are people who say that really what the U.S. needs to do is move quickly to develop space control capabilities to put weapons in space and really see you know that it's so you know the the advantage of being the the of having space supremacy it would be so large that we need to grab it now technically it's not clear how feasible that is it seems like it would at least be very expensive to put up a big network of satellite uh, anti-satellite weapons uh, and other space weapons uh and china and russia are pretty clear that if we try to do that they're certainly going to respond they might deploy space weapons of their own um they uh you know they they might develop they might deploy anti-satellite weapons of their own and try and stop us from doing that so they're, they're all you know and they, it goes back to some you know there have been debates for decades on, on this question but as we're becoming more concerned about these space threats you know we're, we're seeing some people say hey we we need to seize the moment um we might also go down a di- diplomatic track and try to secure uh limits on anti-satellite weapons or you know a informal agreements to leave space targets alone. Um, you know, the Outer Space Treaty that was passed, that was approved in the 1960s, everyone agreed not to put nuclear weapons in space, but non-nuclear weapons are allowed. Um, we might try and limit those. Now, the question then is, will China and Russia want to agree to that? Um, especially, you know, maybe we could work out some sort of a trade. You know, maybe we agree to limit some of our ballistic missile defense capabilities that they're especially worried about. There are potential diplomatic avenues, and and I won't be surprised if the Biden administration, uh, you know, lean at least tries to explore some of those. So, you know, I I I I'm I, I in in good you know in good professorial fashion, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to suggest that you think about you know what sorts of directions make sense out of this menu. Um, but some of these are contradictory uh, with each other. I mean, it, it'll be difficult to try and choose all of them. Uh, they have different pros and cons, and they relate to grand strategies differently. So, you know, we, we're we're still struggling. You know, this is one of the things Space Force knows that it need, needs to think about is what are the right strategic directions. Um, well, having mentioned Space Force, uh, you know, as I, I come down to the the last, uh, I guess, 10 minutes or so here, um, let me say a little bit about Space Force. And then, as I promised, also circling back to, to where I began, the civilian space program and the desire to return to the moon. Um, you may have noticed, uh, you know, one, one of the biggest one of the big accomplishments in defense for the Trump administration and one of the biggest organizational changes for the U.S. military in decades. Uh, we've added a, a new service for the first time since the late 1940s. Uh, the U.S. Space Force now exists. General John Raymond uh, is the chief of space operations. I should have put it on the slide, but I will say it. He is also a proud alum of the Naval War College. Uh, he was, last year, he was actually able to come and speak at our future warfighting symposium. Uh, that wasn't possible this year, but we we look forward to having him back again someday. And in addition to creating an entirely new service, we also elevated Space Command from a subordinate command of our strategic command, the the command that controls nuclear forces. Uh, we now made it a geographic command in the same way that we have four-star headquarters that uh you know for africa for europe for the pacific uh we now say that everything above 100 kilometers in altitude about uh, 60 miles of altitude is space and general raymond who you see in front of you is in charge uh and so that that's also a pretty big change more down in the weeds that that defense uh analysts study we also created a new agency for space r and d um so what is space force all about and uh, to put it simply, Space Force is not about this. Space Force is not about space marines fighting aliens. Space Force is not about laser battles above the Earth or any other planet. Um, space Force, in, in, in any near future, is going to be a little less exciting than that. And even backing off from the most extreme science fiction visions, there are still some very common myths and misperceptions. Um 
although there's certainly the possibility that we could choose a strategy that goes down the road of starting to weaponize space, that's not in the plan right now. Space, despite all the talk about lethality as, as kind of the, the, you know, the, what the Department of Defense delivers, Space Force is not going to have offensive weapons uh, in the immediate future. Space Force is not going to be in charge of protecting the Earth from asteroids. Uh, NASA actually has the lead. If we discover there's a giant asteroid headed for us and we're all going to die, I'm sure we'll involve the military at that point. Um, and contrary, you know, as much fun as it watch, was to watch Netflix's show with Steve Carell, um, Space Force does not have astronauts. I mean, there may be some Space Force personnel who get seconded to NASA as astronauts. But Space Force, it won't have astronauts. It won't have a spaceship. It won't have a space station. It's absolutely not going to the moon. Um, it's about knowing what's going on in space. Space domain awareness is the, the military term we use to operate and defend, defend being kind of the, the big the big issue here, operate and defend U.S. satellites and possibly conduct counter space operations. I mean, they operate that big jamming dish that I saw. They may have other capabilities like that. Or if we were to develop other space weapons, you know, that, that would be what Space Force does. You know, so just a, a few thoughts on Space Force. In the near term, it's really a bigger political and bureaucratic shift, kind of a signal and just a lot of bureaucracy moving around inside the Defense Department. Um, it's it's mostly taking pieces we already had, putting them together in different ways, and literally putting different uniforms on them. Um, now, in the long term, services like to have a theory of victory. You know, they they like to be able to say we can win the war, we deliver lethality. So there probably is going to be some incentive for Space Force to want to think about how do, how do we deliver victories from space? And I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but we just know, in the, you know, we know bureaucratically that's, that's a likely outcome. Um, we do know that General Raymond thinks that space needs to be more open. Space has typically been, you know, you know the, typically we have gone just short of classifying Newton's laws of motion when it comes to space. Um, Raymond thinks you can't make good use of space and you can't protect space if people don't understand space. So he actually does want to see a lot more openness so that planners across all, so all the military services have a better understanding of space. We also hope that this reorganization will make it cheaper, faster, better to develop new satellites for space. Um, you know, that remains to be demonstrated. We'll, you know, it's possible that these new organizations will deliver that. Um, there have been other experiments in the past that haven't worked. So we will have to see there. Now, the, the, the last big thing for me to note um, is the uh, U.S. is currently planning to go back to the moon. Uh, NASA has a program called Artemis. Uh, the intent uh, originally was to return astronauts to the moon by the year 2024. Um, it seems partly due to COVID and, and all of the budgetary implications, that seems unlikely. Um, but the uh, president, incoming President Biden has already said, you know, that his campaign has said they support the program continuing. It'll probably be a little slower, uh, but I, I think it's still fairly likely that in the late 2020s, we'll try to go back to the moon. And what you see in front of you here, we have gone as far, you know, we, th this is not simply a paper study. We actually have, have issued pretty big contracts to a number of companies to develop hardware. Right now, the three firms that you see in front of you uh, all have large contracts to develop, uh, you know, to do more R&D and develop prototype landers to go to the moon. Uh, NASA is building a giant rocket called the space, uh, SLS. In fact, they are actually going, for the first time ever, they're going to test the engines. They're going to put it in a test stand, fire the whole thing off. Uh, I believe that's supposed to happen on Saturday of this coming weekend. So there actually is hardware being built. Um, you know, and the, the goal is within a few more years to go back to the, to go back to the moon. Well, how does this relate to national security? And, and there are actually a few implications here. Um, it's not like the 1960s, but we still do care about prestige and leadership. Um, the U.S., you know, we, we still tend to think this is an element of American soft power, as it's sometimes called, you know, showing people that the U.S. is a technology leader, uh, that the U.S. is able to do big things. Um, it's not going to be like Apollo. You know, we've we've been to the moon already. You know, it's it's not going to be quite that amazing, but it will still be impressive. And, and we hope that we get back to the moon before China's moon landings, which right now the Chinese are talking about uh, the mid 2030s. I mean, I, I'd be surprised if that becomes much earlier, um, though I'd be surprised if it becomes much later. China's actually had a has a pretty good track record of sticking to 
the goals it announces for its human spaceflight program. The bigger issue for national security is that Artemis is very international. Um, unlike Apollo, which was, you know, we, we wanted the world to watch, but it was all done by the United States. With Artemis, it's more like the International Space Station uh, in that allies like Japan, Europe, and Canada are contributing major pieces. Japan, for example, uh, Toyota has a contract to build a pressurized moon rover that the astronauts can drive around to explore. Canada is contributing equipment. Uh, the European Union is contributing. And I, I don't know for sure, but I, my understanding is the intent would be that non-U.S. astronauts would join. Um, so it's quite possible, you know, a Japanese astronaut will land and walk on the moon as part of this program. And we see that. We see the program in that sense as a way to strengthen alliances, to help build, you know, poli you know, you know, at a popular level and a government to government level to, to strengthen relationships and to get people to to, you know, get countries around the world to see space like the U.S. does and agree. In fact, we literally are working on some diplomatic pieces of this where countries that want to join us in going to the moon need to agree to some basic principles of future space law. Uh, and so we're trying to build sort of a diplomatic coalition with a common vision of how to use space. What are the rules of the road? as part of this. And finally, I'll note, you know, we, we also do tend to think that these sorts of programs, you know, help the defense industrial base. I mean, at a, at a narrow level, the SLS rocket uses solid rocket motors, and we need companies to get, know how to build those to build new military missiles as well. So that's helpful. And encouraging youth, youth uh, in America to be interested in space and to care about space. So I, uh, you know, on, on this, you know, to, to end, uh, to end on, a, on a hopeful note, uh, uh, this is a view back to uh, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but the uh, the blue dot you see in the towards the lower right is the small planet Earth seen from Saturn from the Cassini space probe a few years ago. Uh, so with with that grand vision, I will stop here, hand it back to uh, Professor Jackson and look forward to questions. Thank you much, David. That was uh, an excellent presentation. We, we do have a few questions and. Uh, We'll share them with you at this point. I guess I'm interested in a little clarification on the commercial crew program and the mm -hmm. commercial space transportation program and the degree to which that has changed the environment. NASA always hired civilians to build their spacecraft. What's different now? Sure. What's different now is to 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 go to to step back a little, I, I said I said I wasn't going to talk too much about the space shuttle, but I, I do need to talk about that for a moment here. Um, we, for decades in the U.S., we relied on the space shuttle to get humans and NASA-related cargo into space. Um, that turned out to be expensive and, frankly, more fragile and unsafe than we hoped, and just it became old. It dates back to the 1970s. NASA had a few different programs to try to replace the space shuttle with something new in the 1990s and early 2000s that mostly didn't get very far. They technologies that didn't pan out or programs that kind of ran in circles or stops and starts. So one initiative that the Obama administration started and then the Trump uh, administration continued was – Okay, let's just say we'll give a bunch of money to private companies if they can provide the service of delivering uh, delivering an astronaut to the space station. It's up to them to figure out what the rocket's going to look like. You know, they'll own the hardware. NASA people will ride in it the same way that you would ride in an airliner. Uh, you know, without uh, you know, or you know, better analogy might be like rent. You know, chartering an aircraft or something. You know, because the it, the NASA people are still doing the flying. So a couple of different companies bid, and the company that has gotten the most attention. SpaceX developed their own uh, uh, Crew Dragon, is the name of it, a space capsule that can hold several astronauts to go to and from the space station. They launch it on the Falcon 9 rocket that SpaceX designed and that mostly is used for commercial space launches. So the astronauts inside of that capsule so far have all been NASA, have been NASA employees and NASA is paying SpaceX to take them to the space station, a little bit like we've been giving money to the Russians so that uh, our people can ride along in the Russian capsules. But in this case, we're paying an American company. Um, you know, so NASA, NASA figures, our, you know, our advantage is focusing on the longer term R&D, on the exploration, the 
put people in a capsule, go to orbit and come back is an established enough technology. I mean, that's been done since the 1960s now um, that they've decided to give that to the private sector. And SpaceX uh, has been pretty amazing at how cheaply they've been able to accomplish that. Um, I mean, it raises some tough questions about why is government so expensive? Why are traditional contractors like Boeing or Lockheed so slow and so expensive? And I don't know if the right, you know, I, the, maybe the answer is as simple as if you can pay the smartest people in the world a whole lot more money than the government can and let them do whatever the heck they want, uh, they'll all come to work for you and they'll just do amazing stuff that you can't make happen in, you know, the bureaucratic environment we live in India. You know, I look forward to a book that, I mean, there, there have been some popular stories. I look forward to a book that really explains in detail what have they been able to, how have they been able to do it? Because it's, it's quite amazing. There's a very interesting book called The Space Billionaires, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that, that does a really good job, in my mind, of uh, going through SpaceX and mm -hmm. Blue Origin and, and all of these major players and kind of saying how they've grown up. So I'd recommend that to the yeah. audience. In fact, I will. I'll actually be assigning it for an elective I'm teaching on space. This for, or the the rocket. There there are two books: can, the Space Barons and the Rocket Billionaires. They're actually pretty. I chose the Rocket Billionaire. I I, I think may have just been cheaper, but you know they're they're you know they're, yeah those those are the two good popular stories of how that happened and and e, 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 good easy reads. Absolutely, uh, one of the questioners uh, goes back to your discussion of. Are you willing to kill someone because they destroyed some of your technology? And you use the example of the drone shoot down. Uh, the questioner wonders, is there a class of material or a class of systems that in your mind might justify a, uh, a kill decision? Um, well, I, I don't I don't want to say that's above my pay grade, but um, that's that's going to be the tough political and ethical question uh, to consider. And uh, I, I will say we, you know, there are a lot of similarities in that question to what we that what we face with cyber, what we face with drones and some of the best international law of armed and law of armed conflict people in the world are here at the Naval War College or the Naval Justice School um, who really, you know, have really, th you know, thought carefully about what does the law of armed conflict say about that. Um, I, I think they're probably, you know, if, if we were to see an adversary start taking out our missile early warning satellites, um, I mean, that that would be an extremely, you know, because the, there's the only advantage to that is if you were really thinking about really getting close to a large scale missile attack on the United States. So I, I think that would probably, you know, that that would not be a, you know, let's carefully, you know, we'll send a diplomatic note or, you know, that that would that would be a hey, this is an indicator that we're headed for a much bigger escalation of the war pretty quickly. Um, one good thing is that the, those missile warning satellites are actually in a pretty high orbit, so they're they're less they're harder to hit, less likely to be hit by debris from something accidentally. Um, you know, I, I would think you know we and the Russians and I think the Chinese now have missile early warning satellites. Uh, I, I suspect we all agree those those ought to be left alone. Um, you know, my my sense from the research that I've seen is it's actually really hard to get civilian policymakers to feel good about taking a life in exchange for an attack that where there wasn't even any, you know, where there wasn't any risk to personnel. Um, now, if if somebody tries to bomb you and they miss slightly, and that's the only reason people didn't die, that's different. Um, but it's very hard to get policymakers to feel good about, um, you know, let's, you know, let's take lives in exchange for this piece of equipment being destroyed in a way that nobody's life was at risk. And I think that's that's a big issue that we're, you know, because as we depend more and more on pieces of equipment that fit that description, whether they it be cyber, you could use the same argument with undersea fiber optic cables. Uh, I mean, if 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 there, you know, space space gets a lot of attention. If if there's something that get that doesn't get the attention it deserves, the vulnerability to the destruction of fiber optic cable networks uh, is also something we probably ought to be thinking about more. Um, right now, my sense is is there there's a lot of reluctance. Um, you know, I my my thought is there are some infrastructure that's so vital to our military operations. If you put it in a box that says, if you target this narrowly, 
we won't shoot back because you didn't hurt anybody. Um, that's going to be a box that's going to be of interest to adversaries. And so we, you know, I, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, kind of not an easy call for me, but it's, it, it is certainly, and I'm sure we think about that too. You know, when we think about how would an adversary respond? So, you know, I don't, I don't have a firm, I would kill someone over this answer because I'm, I'm a, and I'm able to be a little professorially and say kind of, this is how to think about it, but it, it's going to be a dilemma we've, we've got to deal with. On a, uh, perhaps a bit of a political basis, uh, do you believe the Space Force will survive the uh, new administration. Is Space Force a good idea in and of itself, regardless <laughs> of the politics involved? Um, let, uh, short answer to the first one is yes. Uh, Space Force, I mean, it's in law. You would have to, uh, re you, it would be a significant congressional action to undo Space Force and a big bureaucratic action. I mean, with enough has happened that, you know, there'd be a lot of pieces to fit back into the Air Force and the other services. So the, I think Joe Biden would never have created Space Force on his own, I, I don't think. Um, but I don't think his administration is going to be interested. You know, there's not enough demand on even from the Democrats. And I think the Republicans would would see that as sort of repudiating a real Trump legacy. And even and, and partly that's because to take the larger question about the creation of Space Force, I didn't think creating Space Force as a separate service made sense. But there were there was a general sense that the air force probably wasn't focusing on space enough in some ways and that certainly that space operations probably deserved its own uh four star level command instead of being part of uh stratcom so there were a number of ideas like maybe you create a space agency that's sort of like a uh, special forces command where it's not a service but it's got you know, in addition to commanding forces, uh, SOCOM has some of its own ability to do R&D and procurement. You know, I, I, I think kind of among the, the defense expert community, the general sense was that might make sense because when you create a service, I mean, you can see this, you know, they're spending a lot of time figuring out what's the uniform going to look like. There's been a big political fight over is Space Force going to have Air Force style ranks or Navy style ranks? You know, is it going to be Space General or Space Admiral, um, and you know, setting up headquarters or is Space Force going to have its own Space War College? You know, answer no, not in the near future. Um, I, I think the bureaucratic overhead was not necessary, but now that it's a done deal, it's it's probably not worth trying to to undo it. Other than that, Biden probably won't expand Space Force and probably won't talk about it uh, as much as Trump did. Uh, one final question on the uh, commercial side. Uh, uh, SpaceX is launching the Starlink constellations, and I've read as many as 12,000 satellites involved in this constellation. And I understand that many uh, astronomers are concerned that we're going to blanket the sky with uh, uh, so many satellites we won't be able to see the stars. Do you believe that? <laughs> um Oh, oh, you were you were going right after my uh, my my pet rocks. Um, I I'm you know I, I come into space from an interest in astronomy and and photography as a kid. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm worried about that. And there's been enough pressure that SpaceX has actually been researching ways to make the satellites less reflective so that they're not as bright. Um, and that's good, but there's there's still going to be. No, I mean, if you if you're in the middle of downtown Newport and you look up, you're not going to see one of the SpaceX satellites. They're too dim for that. Um, whether it's SpaceX or whether it's you know a comp but you know twenty thirty years from now, you might look up at the sky an hour after sunset, and as one one person one astronomer phrased it you look up and the sky will feel like it's crawling all over the place because there might be hundreds of just at the edge of visibility satellites all moving slowly as you look up. And I mean, 
I think psychologically that's going to be pretty weird. I mean, maybe not to kids who grow up with it. Um, you, you know, this this is, that may not be a huge military issue, but I do worry about that. What might be more of a military issue that, that I'll mention is there are, DOD actually has some real concerns about radio frequency interference. Not, I don't think Starlink is the number one issue, but we have been granting licenses to some of these satellite operators. Um, like I, there's there's one operator, uh, the ground portion of what it's doing. Basically, FAA and DOD both said this is going to wreck GPS for every you know people on the ground. You know, planes are literally the FAA said planes will crash because of this. So there's actually a fight going on. You know, the the it's odd to see the Defense Department and the Federal Communications uh, uh, Commission arguing that strenuously, but you are seeing DOD, you know, which in the Cold War, if DOD said we need this frequency, the military got that frequency. You are now seeing the U.S. military say, hey, we have some real concerns about the uh, the RF spectrum that's being allocated for this use, and DOD doesn't always win those fights anymore. So that that's something we're probably going to have to think about is some of the, the spectrum uh, conflict implicate, you know, radio spectrum conflicts that, that these constellations pose. Uh, final question. The uh, questioner is asking with regard to uh, uh, adversaries being able to attack uh, space assets and whatnot. Do you see a increased interest in protection of the homeland and do you see a buyer or a need to change our operating plans to accommodate those changes? Um. Yeah, that's that. That's it, it's a it, it's a big and great question. Um. I mean, power projection is easier against adversaries who can't project power back at you. And whether it be the ability to go after space assets or, you know, the the eye opener I like to toss out, if the U.S. were to target, you know, China's main, you know, one of their main Navy bases on Hainan Island in a conflict, um, it's certainly re- consistent under the arm, you know, laws of armed conflict if the Chinese put a couple of conventional cruise missiles into San Diego. Uh, or, you know, if we destroy, if we happen to hit their naval defense, you know, naval education facility on Hainan Island, uh, you know, maybe a Chinese submarine sends a couple of cruise missiles under the bridge into the Naval War College. Uh, you know, we, I hope not, um, you know, but, uh, as we deal with, with powers that have the ability to respond, because the, the big, you know, uh, I'm going kind of big picture here, um, in the Cold War, our adversaries could really only shoot back at the U.S. homeland with nuclear missiles. You know, we're now facing adversaries who they can go after space capabilities that are important to our civilian economy. They might even be able to conduct conventional strikes uh, against uh, homeland targets. Certainly, you could imagine the Chinese wanting to strike, uh, you know, Guam or Hawaii. Uh, so I think I don't think we have fully thought through at the political level what does it mean that like the homeland may not be a sanctuary anymore? Uh, and whether that be we lose GPS and because nobody knows how to read a map anymore, nobody, you know, and nobody knows how to how to get to the store or cell phones don't work or, you know, even, you know, conventionally we, uh, you know, we take hits on American territory from a peer that we're in conflict with. So um, I you know, I, I personally probably lean on the side of whether we like it or not. We probably have to lower our ambitions in a world where we're not our power projection capability is not so unilaterally dominant over others. Others take the view of, well, we just have to make our power projection capability that much stronger again. I, 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 I think it's hard to win that race. Um, you know, but if if somebody made me grand strategy king, I would probably, you know, say that we're we're looking you know more like reducing as opposed to increasing ambitions globally. Very good. Any last uh, comments you'd like to uh, pass along before we? Uh, wrap? Um, you know, I, I I think I will I will leave it there. I um you know I I, I saw a couple you know I appreciate uh, all the questions. Uh, I saw a couple others in chat that we weren't able to get to. So uh you know thank you very much for the interest. Um you know space uh, space is only going to be more important. So you know l- learn about it. There's exciting stuff happening, and uh, you know I appreciate you taking your time to listen this afternoon, and uh, hope you all have the the best remainder of your time here in Newport. Live long and prosper, Dave. Indeed. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, As we wrap up here, I just remind everybody that our next lecture will be on the 26th of January. 
and we're going to hear about how the U.S. military plans to safeguard cultural treasures in the future, work that's going to be done by what they call the new monuments men and monuments women. So we think that'll be of particular interest, so we hope to see you back on the 26th. Once again, we will not have a family discussion group meeting uh, this week, but we will in two weeks. So thank you very much for joining us uh, and uh, have a good day.